So today we wanted to have a conversation with Suzanne Klingenstein um, uh, regarding the significance of uh, the cantata singer's performance of Mendelssohn's Elijah. Um, Elijah uh, was produced in an extraordinary cultural climate and Dr. Klingenstein was, uh, has amazing insights into uh, that cultural climate that we wanted to explore with her. Um, Suzanne is a writer and literary scholar who teaches philosophy and history of medicine um, at Harvard MIT. Um, she's a regular contributor to the contributor to the Frankfurt Al Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung uh, and the Weekly Standard, as well as a scholar of American studies. Um, I came to know um, Suzanne through uh, her excellent lecture series uh, called "What Is German?" through the Goethe Institute, um, and uh, was very pleased to that she accepted our invitation to talk to us and cantata singers about Mendelssohn um, and Elijah. So thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I think I sh the first thing I should say is that I'm not an expert on 18th century music, uh, nor am I an expert on Mendelssohn's life. I do know a little something about the 18th century from the Enlightenment to Romanticism. When we are looking at Mendelssohn's life, and it's really essential to really understand what time frame we're looking at, we're looking at 1809 to his death in 1847. And if you're looking at this time period, you can just see that there is not, there was no German Reich at this point. Uh, Germany was split into different principalities, and it is actually the period that is central for the formation of the German consciousness. We have a shift from the 18th century, from Mendelssohn, Moses Mendelssohn, who was Mendelssohn, uh, Felix Mendelssohn's Bartholdi's grandfather, to uh, Romanticism, and it is during that period that you have the formation of what we would say German nation as a Nation der Dichter und Denker that happens in that period. And Mendelssohn plays a formative role in that period, especially uh, during the, in 1829 when he was reviving the St. Matthew Passion. So what we can talk about are those huge shifts that are essential uh, for Mendelssohn. Now if you're looking at Mendelssohn's uh, life, um, it is wonderful to see actually that if he, he begins to study with a man called Zelda in 1819 when he was only 10 and years old. himself has connections to Bach, we can talk about them later. 10 years later in 1829 we get the revival of the St. Matthew Passion which is he is now 20 years old and he's at the midpoint in his life. So he's 20 years old, he really only has uh, another um, 18 years to live. So in the midpoint of his life, he is entering public awareness with the name Mendelssohn performing, bringing to a performance in the Singh Academy the central work of Christian Protestantism, the Saint Matthew um, Passion by, by Bach. And then if you're talking about choral works, since you'll be performing Elias, which was performed in 1846. You have Elias in 1846, and you have before this in 1836, you have Paul, another great oratory for him. So you have a sequence of oratories, if you, if you so wish, or of masses or of choral music, moving from Bach's Passion to Paul to Elijah, and you have an interesting sequence from a work that is centrally Christian, is about the Passion of Christ, and the central sentence in the Passion is, ja, er ist, um, er ist Gottes Sohn. This is a divinity, a statement of the divinity of Christ, and it is almost as if he, in the course of his life, is taking that statement back. Because you have Paul, who is a Jew, Saul to Paul, who converts to Judaism, and you have at the end of his life, not a Christian figure in the great oratory that you will be performing, but you have someone who is the harbinger of the Messiah, but not the Christian Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. So you have, if you're talking about, and you mentioned this before we started our recording, I want to hear a little something about the sequence of oratories in Mendelssohn's life. You have a very interesting movement from a confession or a bekenntnis, as the Germans would say, from a statement of Christianity to a almost a gradual backtracking to, at the very end, almost an, an, an equivocal um, positioning himself, yes, he's a Jew. 
Now, I said this first in order to position Mendelssohn's life, and this is something that I learned from Steinberg's article, who said, you always need to be aware that there's a duality in Mendelssohn. Always need to be aware. On the one hand, it was said, we don't have that much confirmation for it, that he was a devout Lutheran. And on the other hand, no one in Berlin society ever allowed him to forget that he was a Mendelssohn, that he was Mendel's son, that he was born as a Jew. Now, this duality has a history in Mendelssohn's life. And I want to just point out three relatives of Mendelssohn, actually four. Now, and I'm going to go on the board again, if, if that's okay. Um, if we take the duality in Mendelssohn's life, on the one hand, born a Jew, on the other hand, wanting to fit into German society at the time, which meant that he had to become a Christian. Anti-Semitism or the dislike of Jews was established or was a fact of German life to the degree that Jews had the right, even, even if you lived in Berlin. Now, part of Mendelssohn's family, first of all, um, so his name is uh, Felix, his grandfather, so his father is was the granddaughter was over, um, of Leah was the daughter of Bella. She was the daughter of Daniel Hitzig. And Daniel Hitzig was a very wealthy Berlin Jew. Bella was his daughter. And those people traced their descent down from a Talmud scholar of great importance, Moshe Isalis, who lived in the 1520s, 1520s and beyond. And not just this, Moses Mendelssohn too, through his mother, traced her lineage to exactly the same Talmud scholar, Moshe Isalis. Moses, and that is who uh, Moses Mendelssohn was named for, Moshe Isalis, a great Talmud scholar in, in, in Krakow. No duality here. Straight commitment to Talmudic studies. This line, the Moshe Isalis line, generated a family called Wolf. And the Wolf family lived in Poland, had to flee, went to Hamburg, and one of the descendants became what is called a court Jew in Dessa. For 40 years, he bankrolled the principality of Dessa. And what it means to be a poor Jew is, on the one hand, you are firmly rooted in Jewish life. On the other hand, you are part of the aristocracy. You are company, you are duke, you are king, you are aristocratic ruler, you are monarch. To all the conventions, to uh, meetings, to wherever he needs to go, and you are firmly part of German aristocratic society, speaking the German language. On the other hand, this wolf, this Benjamin, Moses Benjamin Wolf, also um, established a uh, teaching, a, a Christian, a Hebrew Christian, and established a school in Beismith, in Beismith, in Dessau. That means he was in, he lived in both worlds. This man, very important, for 40 years bankrolled the uh, principality of, of, of Dessau, died in August 1729. Five days later, Moses Mendelssohn was born, was Moses Benjamin, and that is where the name Moses come from. So not just from Moshe Isalas, but also from, from this Moses who, who was lived in both worlds. Mendelssohn, Moses Mendelssohn, born in 1729, became the primary uh, philosopher of the Enlightenment, but not just as when he was challenged by Lavata to say either he said, I am challenging you, I'm presenting you here just with this French work, which proves that the superiority of Christianity. Either you disprove the validity of Christianity, then you're okay, or if you can't disprove it, you must convert. And this challenge cut Mendelssohn, Moses Mendelssohn, so to the quick that he felt very ill afterwards. He did um, to have this discussion with Lavater, but he felt extremely hurt that he of being an enlightenment philosopher, he would be challenged and put on the spot 
This just became very clear in one of the articles by Steinberg that, that you graciously um, sent to me. Meaning, when you then have, when you then are challenged to perform in public a work that is as much a piece of as Matthew Passion, this is a public statement. You say here, look, just as my grandfather wrote um, Enlightenment philosophy in gorgeous German, I am here to say, by virtue of my ability to perform this work for you, or basically con to conduct it and to ex um, present it to you in all its complexity, and it was f since 1717, I believe, the first uh, in total performance, where there were some edits, of course, of, of the passion, it meant that he made a commitment to the culture that he belonged, belonged and didn't belong. And that would lead us to the question now. So we have a great, great ancestor, who's a fantastic Thomas scholar. We have a court Jew who is on the one hand building a Hebrew printing press, which produced beautiful editions of, of, of the Talmud and, and Talmudic commentary. We have a philosopher, you see you're moving closer and closer into German culture, who on the one hand, is an Enlightenment philosopher. On the other hand, brings uh, the Torah into German, but printed in, in Hebrew letters, so still moving in both worlds. And that consciousness, even though we say, yes, Mendelssohn moved entirely into German culture, but the awareness that it wasn't quite part of that was still there. And so when he's 20 years old, and he had finished, officially almost, finished his studies with Zelter, he had produced already an enormous body of work he was just about to go off to England because his father Abraham said to him, son, um, you did well. We now want you to go explore the world. I am bankrolling for you three years in London. And he left before the third performance, actually, of the, of the St. Matthew Passion, which was then conducted by, by Zelda. But, but he left in, in, in April, and he, and, he, and he went to London and, of course, built an, an enormous reputation there. So at this point, before he's leaving, and just as he's presenting himself to the public as a professional composer, one would say, he produces this work. So on the one hand, you would say, yes, that is a confession, um, confessio, bekenntnis, um, an affirmation. I am part of this culture to which this work belongs. It's a work written in German. Right? It is not a Latin, a Latin work. It is very important that it's German. Uh, and I'm presenting you this work. And the key question we now have to ask, and I'm harping so much on, on, on the Spach work because, as I told you about the sequence of oratories that we have, 1829, 1836, 1846, I think that these works speak to each other. So we need to look at what was the importance of the Mass in Matthew Passion, right? We need to ask, what was the importance of performing this work by Bach for Mendelssohn? And what was the importance of this work for the audience? And is it the same? Right? So. Is it the same? Does the Matthew, does performing a word of Bach mean the same thing for Mendelssohn who's performing it and wants to do it? What is his relation to Bach? Why is that work so important to him? And how was it received? What was the interpretation that the audience was giving to the work? So for that reason, because it's at, at the age of 20 and it's a halfway point in his life, and because later he uses bits and pieces of what he learned from this um, great work to compose his own his own oratories. I think one needs to look at this question. Okay.